Instead of what he thought would be a short, victorious war, Vladimir Putin has mired Russia in a protracted and costly struggle that may not only end Putin's tenure in the Kremlin, but also threatens the integrity of the Russian Federation itself. The stakes could not be higher, and history shows that change in Russia moves like tectonic plates, nothing for decades, and then pent-up forces are released in violent, dramatic, and unpredictable changes. Some academics and politicians are starting to think the unthinkable and are urging us to make plans to decolonize Russia when the last continental European land empire collapses. History may show that the disintegration of the USSR was not avoided, merely postponed. Welcome to the Silicon Curtain podcast. If you enjoy the materials we create, please like, subscribe to help boost the popularity and help new people discover the important messages of our speakers and guests. Do comment, that helps massively. And also check out the validated Ukrainian charities that are listed in the description of the video. Leila Latipova is a journalist covering politics and civil society in Russia's regions and ethnic republics for the Moscow Times. As an ethnic Tatar hailing from the Republic of Bashkortostan, she is deeply passionate about advancing and protecting the rights of Russia's non-Slavic indigenous communities and ethnic minorities through her scholarly and journalistic work, as well as public engagements. Leila, I'm delighted to welcome you to the channel. Thank you so much for inviting me. Well, let's let's start with one of the most difficult questions because you know we can move on to historic uh, colonial narratives in Russia, but what's happening now is is extraordinary and terrible, isn't it? The ethnic republics are uh, being hit by outsize. Uh, number of war casualties compared to their size as a proportion of the population. Why is this happening? Because it seems to be a conscious choice. Yes, uh, I guess, you know, it depends on who you ask, <laughs> why is it happening? Uh, you know, the kind of mainstream narrative uh, among the vast majority of scholars uh, of Russia uh, is this is all the, in the economy. You know, there is uh, economic inequality between the regions, but also, you know, between the ethnicities in Russia. Uh, you know, but I think the dangerous part is that their explanation stops at that. And no one asks the key question, why do ethnic republics have to be poorer than uh, the rest of the country? And why do non-ethnic Russians have to be um, more economically disadvantaged than ethnic Russians. Um, and of course, you know, the answer is, it is very much structural discrimination. Because um, if we look uh, at the republics that are suffering uh, outsized casualties, uh, and right now, for example, Bashkortostan, my uh, native republic is leading uh, in absolute numbers as well. Uh, I think uh, it is in the top three right now, uh, when it comes to confirmed casualties. Uh, and Bashkortostan is one of the most resource-rich places in Russia. Um, it has, uh, you know, enormous um, uh, amounts of oil, uh, you know, it not only does it, um, uh, not only does it do oil extraction, but it also one of the few places in Russia that has oil refineries, uh, which is a very interesting, uh, aspect because Russia might uh, extract a lot of oil, but Russia has uh, a very severe shortage of oil refineries. A lot of oil is shipped to Belarus, for example. Uh, so Bashkortostan is one of the few places that really drives that part of Russia's economy. Uh, Bashkortostan, uh, and maybe we'll cover that later, also has enormous amounts um, of limestone. And that's very important because that's where the baking soda that we all, uh, you know, use comes from. A lot of the soda steel shipped in the European Union comes from Bashkortostan. Um, so, you know, it's an uh, incredibly well-developed economy. But for some reason, um, for a lot of people, and fun fact, a lot of them happen to be non-ethnic Russians from districts uh, that are populated by uh, Bashkorts, the indigenous people of the Republic. They don't have, um, you know, they can't find well-paid jobs. So for many at the beginning, you know, enlisting in the army uh, and no one at, back then, you know, expected that they will be going to fight. Everyone thought that, oh, it's a routine job that I do. I'm stationed somewhere, you know, within Russia. 
I get my paycheck, etc. So for many of them, uh, the army was a very, um, you know, kind of easy way to earn a uh, salary that is above uh, the average regional standard. Uh, then, of course, you know, uh, Russia invaded Ukraine. Uh, those people ended up on the front lines and situation changed dramatically. Um, but then, you know, with the outsized mobilization, again, um, for Russia, uh, it was just, I guess, easier to be far more brutal uh, in those places as, you know, more remote regions of Bashkortostan populated by ethnic Bashkorts, because there they would just uh, get people, you know, in swaths. Uh, there are horrific, uh, you know, accounts of, you know, military men just coming into the villages and just grabbing everyone they could find. Uh, you know, uh, I think the uh, situation was even worse in Buryatia, for example, because there, uh, you know, they called it the night of terror because when the mobilization was announced in smaller villages, um, uh, military men would literally storm the houses and take men out of the beds and, uh, you know, ship them off. Um, so that's... Uh, a short account <laughs> on this very, very, you know, um, difficult question. Well, let's let's uh, link historic uh, ethnic repression uh, and mass murder, it has to be said as well, with what's happening at the moment, as well as this idea of poverty, because people might think, OK, well, it's it's, uh, you know, it's it's, it's the normal thing. It's uh, racial prejudice, etc., and sort of structural poverty that you may get in Western countries uh, due to racial prejudice. It seems to me from the historical record and even right through Putin's regime that it's more uh, it's more iniquitous than that. It's a conscious attempt to make sure that ethnic minorities as a mass, um, irrespective of talents, intelligence, etc., abilities remain poor. Uh, because remaining poor means it's far more difficult to organize politically. People are concentrated on living, surviving, basically, um, and don't have that uh, you know, additional time and energy to devote to, to politics. Um, we'll come to the repression of culture later because that's another aspect of it. But could we just address this idea that keeping people outside of the large cities and especially ethnic minorities in poverty is a conscious political strategy. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, it has very deep roots uh, also in the Soviet system. Uh, and there is a lot of uh, kind of little structural ways that prevent ethnic minorities and indigenous people uh, from, you know, uh, living better economically. Uh, and it's a paradox, you know, because um, coming back to Bashkortostan, you know, a lot of people uh, living in predominantly Bashkir, um, Bashkor uh, districts of Bashkortostan, their native language is Bashkort. Uh, even though, you know, all the schools uh, right now are Russified, Bashkort is still the language they speak at home and they probably speak uh, Russian with an accent. That's where the problems start. Uh, you know, uh, you may be incredibly smart, but you're not permitted to, you know, use your uh, native tongue uh, to, you know, express or develop your ideas. Um, you know, then you try to go into university. There is no teaching in uh, native languages, of course. So you have to use Russian. Uh, for most, that's second language uh, that already presents difficulty. Most people master Russian, of course. But uh, then there is also a question of, do you speak with an accent? If you do, you will always be perceived differently. Um, so here, you know, it comes, uh, it's uh, preserving ethnic identity at a cost uh, of uh, economic well-being. So there are, of course, a lot of families uh, that are now completely, you know, russified, even though they're ethnic uh, from of indigenous, you know, or ethnic minority background. And there are families who preserve that uh, but, but at a cost of, you know, not being economically well off. Um, now, you know, I wouldn't, uh, I know, you know, that there is this whole idea that, uh, you know, there must be social mobility of people moving into the cities, you know, and that that's how kind of economic development goes on. Um, 
I, I'm a bit against that, to be frank. I think, you know, people uh, should have the right to live their traditional lifestyle, live in the villages and still live uh, as well as a person living in a city. Uh, and, you know, given the landmass that Russia is, uh, you know, in Bashkortostan, for example, um, Ufa is the capital. It has 1.5 million uh, people living in it, but majority of the population still lives in smaller towns and villages. Um, and I think, you know, those places should be developed too, and those people should have the right to, you know, participate in the economy, etc. cetera. Uh, and, you know, um, there is a point that I always say, you know, R Russian oil doesn't come from the Red Square. Nothing comes from the big cities. Uh, it's all it's the towns and the villages that actually drive the economy. And do we know what percentage of that wealth ends up in Moscow? I mean, it, it, it changes slightly from era to era, but that's a fundamental, isn't it, between the Soviet Union, between Putin's Russia and uh, even Tsarist period, although ironically, perhaps more wealth ended up outside of the capital cities Um in the Tsarist era than they do now. Do we know what that proportion of wealth that's concentrated in the capital is? So it really depends by the republic, uh, how much uh, each republic gives. I mean, most of the uh, profits uh, do, you know, that they kind of go to Moscow first and then Moscow redistributes them uh, to regions, which is a horrible system. Uh, you know, I guess uh, the only exception here is Tatarstan, because uh, Tatarstan is the only republic uh, that has been able to uh, preserve ownership uh, of majority of its natural resources. So, you know, Tatneft, uh, the uh, large, the Tatarstan's oil giant, uh, and then several other companies, they still belong to the republic. So all the profits, they remain in Tatarstan. Though, again, you know, Tatarstan is subjected to uh, much of taxation, etc. They they still lose the money, but uh, there is at least um, this ability to own something right now. And uh, if I, you know, may look into the future, that's a great prerequisite for future development, of course. And when it comes to the industries, so we're talking about extraction industries. Um, although you did mention that there are significant numbers of refineries, but in extraction and to an extent refineries even more so, these are quite specialist jobs and I would assume better paid than many jobs uh, outside of the extraction economy, outside of the sort of oil or mineral economy. Um, is there prejudice there to try and keep minorities out of those jobs and into lower paid jobs? Uh, again, is that a discernible uh, trend we see? Yeah, it is a thing. I think, you know, it is far more pronounced uh, in kind of northern republics. Uh, so Saha, for example, is also a good example, because there uh, a lot of companies which are owned by Russian state, uh, you know, oil companies or gas uh, companies, they do prefer um, contracting um people from, you know, the big land, most of whom uh, come to be ethnic Russians, uh, you know, uh, and th they come and take the jobs, um, basically. So that's how uh, Russia has been changing uh, ethnic composition, particularly of the Northern Republics, uh, you know, where now indigenous people uh, are a minority. Um, in uh, Bashkortostan, I wouldn't say that is a trend, uh, but also Bashkortostan is very ethnically mixed. So I think it's very difficult to distinguish, you know, that there is a particular um, ethnic discrimination happening. Uh, but uh, I think that's also a legacy uh, of the 1990s. Uh, you know, Bashkortostan was really fighting for its sovereignty till the end. Uh, so uh, there is kind of a local economy that is established. There are several universities specializing uh, on extraction. You know, there is the Ufa Oil Petroleum University, one of the largest in Russia. Uh, so, you know, people usually study there and then they can go uh, and get a job. And uh, yeah, I wouldn't say that there is um, any ethnic discrimination in that. In fact, you know, probably Sam in Bashkortostan would say that in the 1990s and early 2000s, it actually was the way that uh, Bashkorts would get preferential admission to those places and preferential treatment. Um, and that's the legacy, you know, of what many label the parade of sovereignties, uh, you know, uh, that happened after the collapse of the Soviet Union. And that's interesting then. Can we make a link between the protests that have happened recently in Bashkortostan, which seem to have a level of organization that is not apparent in other protests? And of course, their scale 
uh, and the fact that they seem to have some sort of organized agenda um, rather than simply being a show of opposition. Um, can we link that fight for sovereignty in the 90s um, and potentially, you know, the higher number of sort of specialists and educated people with the fact that we see this manifestation of protest now, which as Putin's Russia descends into, uh, I would say, uh, not quite at the Stalin level, but let's face it, it's descending into uh, serious repression that's reminiscent of the 1930s. Uh, how is it that Bash courts were able to uh, to sort of gather and protest in the way that they did? Yes, yeah, so with Bashkortostan, you know, current protests, they do have their roots in the 1990s, uh, but uh, the roots are of the kind that uh, the whole sovereignty movement of the 1990s in Bashkortostan was very much connected uh, to, um, you know, the consequences that, uh, you know, the, indust the Soviet industrialization had uh, on uh, the environmental um uh on on the environment in Bashkortostan. Uh so uh you know uh following uh, especially after the World War II, Bashkortostan experienced very rapid uh industrialization. Uh there were a lot of uh industrial plants that were relocated to Bashkortostan, um, including from Ukraine, uh Belarus, um, and eastern uh western pardon uh part of Russia. Uh, so a lot of them ended up in Bashkortostan, and that's a kind of how economic development boomed. Uh, and of course, all of that uh, was done uh, with uh, complete negligence for any environmental standards. Uh, and uh, Bashkortostan did experience, uh, you know, um, just horrible air pollution, uh, air, air pollution, uh, and as well as water pollution, etc. cetera, uh, let alone that all of this uh, industrial development was happening with complete negligence for indigenous rights, because all of those are indigenous Bashkort, Bashkort lands, uh, which were uh, very brutally uh, developed by the Soviets. So uh, when the 1990s came, this uh, kind of desire for greater so sovereignty and preservation of uh, ethnic uh, rights, you know, the right for language, uh, et cetera, it kind of merged uh, with this big environmental movement uh, that was growing in Bashkortostan. Uh, and the two became the catalysis for um, the larger, you know, movement for uh, independence uh, and sovereignty. So, uh, you know, fast forwarding to today, uh, these kind of two movements, they still exist, uh, kind of, they go hand in hand. Uh, there is the fight for environmental rights, which... Uh, is closely entangled with the fight for indigenous rights. So uh, the two kind of camps of activists, they always work together. Uh, and uh, yeah, so what we saw in Bashkortostan earlier this year, uh, that was, um, you know, a manifestation of both. It was a um, fight for the right, you know, to uh, own your land, to be able to, um, have control of natural resources that your land has to offer uh, for ethnic Bashkorts, you know, uh, but also uh, it was a uh, environmental fight in, in that, uh, you know, because uh, the reason those protests started is because uh, Bashkort government uh, was, uh, has commissioned uh, to start uh, new gold mining explorations in this predominantly uh, Bashkort district. Um, and, uh, first of all, uh, you know, uh, no one, uh, among the indigenous population there had any say whether, you know, they want their lands to be developed or not. Uh, secondly, the potential contractor for that job was a complete outsider. Uh, in fact, I think, you know, it was, um, there is a rumor that there were, it were people linked, uh, to, uh, the wife, uh, of a current governor, Radi Khabirov, uh, and she's Armenian. Uh, and apparently those were not even citizens of Russia. They were Armenian citizens who would come and, you know, mine gold in Bashkortostan. Uh, and, uh, you know, that there is that that's the indigenous part, but also, you know, that would have uh, incredible environmental damage uh, to those places, you know, uh, particularly for uh, on uh, water resources. Um, 
Yeah, so that's, you know, how this uh, kind of two issues, you know, the environmental and the indigenous in Bashkoristan, they merge and they become this, um, yeah, kind of catalysis, they catalyze uh, this fight for greater sovereignty and independence. And it's an interesting uh, position, isn't it? Because these kind of movements, these indigenous movements and indeed environmental movements that merge and come together, um, they're very little known outside of uh, uh, of the Russian Federation. Um, I, I'm, I'm guessing they're very little known even within the majority of population within the Russian Federation, because I doubt whether they get much sort of coverage uh, in the press. But there has been talk of decolonization narratives uh, in parts of the Western press. I would say it's not that extensive. And some of the so-called Russian opposition are playing with the idea but in a, in a, uh, I would call it a, uh, yeah, I don't want to put a label on it, but let's say they're not, they're, they're not that comfortable with it. Uh, ethnic uh, Russians, even in the, in the opposition. Um, and there's a range of opinions there, but foreign commentators seem to swing wildly between on the one hand, complete ignorance of these movements. On the other hand, they then place on these movements, I think expectations that are far too great. One of these being Russia's going to fragment, um, indigenous peoples are going to take back their land and republics. Um, and we we swing from some sort of fairly ignorant position to a fairly unrealistic position um, without actually landing on the complex reality. Um, is that a fair summary? And what is the complex reality? Are indigenous peoples going to contribute to the fragmentation, break up, decolonization? Or is this a fairly fanciful idea? Yeah, I think that's a great uh, summary summary of what's happening. And uh, unfortunately, you know, I feel like much of that discussion is happening on social media and Twitter, etc. You know, and um, I once was trying to explain that complex reality, and someone told me, "No, this is Twitter. We don't do nuanced discussions." You know, um, complex reality, oh, uh, you know, is is as complex as this that as this country is big. You know, it's it's very. Um, it differs republic by republic because, you know, ethnic compositions differ. In some places, Russians have become a majority. Uh, in other places, uh, you know, uh, the indigenous population uh, is still the majority. Uh, some republics are very, very mixed. Uh, you know, so if we're talking, you know, collapse or... Um, some kind of refederalization of Russia, uh, it will differ, you know, what republics would want and how that would happen. Um, you know, I think uh, to kind of just scratch the surface of what might happen, uh, you know, and how decolonization or however we want to call it, uh, you know, would look, uh, we can look at uh, Bashkortostan and Tatarstan, for example, you know, it's neighboring republics, Turkic majority, um, kind of close brothers, you know, uh, but they have taken a very different divergent paths in the 1990s. And to this day, they're very different. Um, you know, uh, I'm often asked why Tatarstan, you know, this powerhouse, everyone was calling it, you know, kind of the last vestige of federalism in Russia. Why is there no movement, you know? Why Tatars aren't protesting? You know, Russia has taken the right to study native language. You know, Tatarstan lost a president just after Russia invaded Ukraine, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Why hasn't you know that sparked any protests? Um, well, there are multiple uh, you know explanations to that. One of them is the we we have to look at the elites. We might hate to do so, you know, but we have to. And uh, Tatarstan's uh, you know, president and the current elites, for better or for worse, they have been fighting Kremlin till the end, you know, in their own way, much more subtle. Um, but they have preserved um, a lot of cultural autonomy, uh, which is a miracle. You know, we have to uh, give them, you know, <laughs> credit for that. Uh, because, uh, you know, if uh, uh, maybe a lot of some of our listeners, you know, who have been to Russia and have been outside of Moscow, they've probably traveled to Tatarstan because that's a very popular destination. And Tatarstan does kind of live its own life. Uh, you know, I uh, once uh, showed Kazan to my American friend, you know, and, and the first thing she said, she said, 
the only place they're competing here with is Moscow, right? You know, and then I was like, yes, you know, we also have the Kremlin and uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, you know, if we are talking of like potential collapse, I am convinced that in Tatarstan, it will, you know, this um, initiative to grab kind of more sovereignty will come from the elites uh, because, you know, Tatar public in general has grown to trust them. And that's why there has not been any alternative movement that developed because the elites have done the job, um, you know, and I think uh, they very well understand what's going on. Uh, and we can see, you know, how um, Rustam Minikhanov, the head of Tatarstan, he is, you know, leveraging um, his position as much as he can you know, for better or for worse. So I think uh, that's why, you know, people people do trust him. He might be a still a corrupt, uh, you know, local leader, uh, but he has done a lot for the identity preservation. Uh, now in Bashkoristan, again, you know, a neighbor, very different path uh, because the elites there have not been as proactive with the Kremlin, um, you know, Bashkoristan uh, signed uh, in the 90s the federal agreement with Russia uh, quicker than Tatarstan. You know, Tatarstan wanted to leave for good. Um, and then, uh, you know, uh, Moscow was very quick to kind of putting their people in the leadership in Bashkoristan. So that also catalyzed tensions with the larger public. And for better or for worse, uh, that led to development of a very, very strong, you know, civil society. As I said, you know, it initially came from this fight for sovereignty and it's uh, both indigenous groups and uh, environmental activists. Uh, but, you know, in their standoff with the local government, they have been able to develop better links. So that's why we've seen, you know, Bashkoristan has demonstrated probably some of the most sophisticated uh, protests in Russia. So if we're talking what would happen in Bashkoristan, um, I believe most likely Bashkoristan will see protests. I do hope they will be nonviolent, you know, because um, activists in Bashkoristan have developed huge nonviolent toolkit. They're very good at it. Um, but, you know, the transition there will come from below. Uh, and I think, you know, well, in the ideal world, uh, Bashkoristan would have to hold a referendum, you know, on deciding their future. If we turn back to casualties in the war, again, this is an extraordinary number that you quote in one of your articles, and that is around uh, ethnic Buryats, um, who comprise 1.16% uh, of identified casualties on the Russian side of the war, and yet, as a percentage of Russia's total population, they are 0.3%. This is, is absolutely extraordinary. Why have Buryats in particular um, been subject to uh, this kind of mobilization and one would assume thrown into the most uh, dangerous parts of the front? Yeah, so uh, I will proceed by <laughs> stating, you know, that uh, we all know a lot about that and why, you know, that happened thanks to Maria Vyushkova, uh, an incredible researcher from uh, University of Notre Dame uh, in the United States. Uh, she's an ethnic Buryat. And um, Maria has been leading, uh, you know, this literally hand-picked count of ethnic casualties uh, since the start. Um, I don't want to, you know, speak for her, but I know that she took interest in it exactly because, you know, they have been, Buryatia was the first one to receive, you know, bodies from the front lines. Uh, and then, you know, she started looking deeper into the problem. Uh, and basically uh, her and a group of um, multiple activists, you know, from other republics, uh, they uh, continuously do this extensive research on deciphering ethnic casualties from kind of broader casualty lists. And that is because uh, Russia, you know, we, we don't, we no longer have nationality listed in documents, for example. So there is no way uh, to, you know, easily know what nationality is the, per or ethnic what ethnic group does the person who uh, died belongs to. So they do that, um, you know, literally uh, finding, you know, uh, necrologues, um, trying to understand what community do those people belong to. 
Uh, and uh, uh, so Maria's research, uh, you know, uh, with uh, Buryatia, there are several factors that she believes uh, played into this, uh, uh, you know, disproportionate um, casualties, casualty numbers. Uh, first of all, Buryatia in general uh, has uh, a disproportionate number of military bases on its territory compared to the population. Uh, there are a lot of military bases. So, you know, as I said, a lot of people in Buryatia would, uh, and again, it's a, a comparatively, you know, not very well off region. So a lot of people in Buryatia would enlist to work on military bases. And, you know, we know some accounts of people who would later become conscientious objectors, and they would say, you know, I went there from my village because I thought I will be like sweeping the floor, you know, for the rest of my life and getting a good salary, but um, no. Um, so there is the part with military bases. And of course, um, uh, you know, when, when Buryats were sent to the front lines, and uh, that is actually a fact, uh, you know, when Russia attacked Ukraine in the first days, they were kind of thrown into that meat grinder grinder head first. Uh, so that's why they were uh, just, you know, swaths of casualties in the first days of war. Um, again, you know, there are structural reasons for that. Um, you know, Maria's research also indicated that, uh, you know, there's quite a good proof that ethnic uh, minorities and indigenous people, and that's particularly true for Asians, they have less opportunity to move up the ranks in the Russian army. Uh, and that's fascinating because it is mostly ethnic Russians. There are some Tatars, I believe ethnic Kazakhs, they kind of have a larger proportion in the top military ranks, but most of the ethnic minorities, you know, they remain uh, in lower ranks. So of course, whenever there is most difficult missions, you know, they just throw them in there. Uh, so, uh, yeah, that's Buryatia. And then again, you know, when uh, mobilization started, and as I said, you know, they've experienced these nights of terror, and they would be uh, just grabbing people in the villages. Uh, now, I think, you know, with mobilization, and uh, that's my theory, I think also, you know, how um, for leaders of those republics, it was a way to show loyalty to the Kremlin. You know, and Tsidienov, the head of Buryatia, he is very similar, you know, to Radi Khabirov. We have this joke that, you know, they're secret brothers. Radi Khabirov is the head of Bashkoristan, but they love using similar strategies. And they were, you know, ahead of everyone, just mobilizing, mobilizing. Um, yeah, so uh, th there are, again, you know, there is a combination of factors. Um, and um, I think it's also in interesting to note, you know, that it's uh, ethnic Buryatia disproportionately represented, but also Buryatia is suffering disproportionately overall. So, you know, there are ethnic Russians as well uh, who are being drafted from the Republic um, and uh, sent to the front lines. And, you know, we don't have detailed stats on this, but of course there have been huge numbers of war crimes committed, you know, vast, mm -hmm. and, and much of it is still under, unaccounted for, especially in occupied territories. There seems, however, to be a concerted effort by Russian propagandists to try and lay the blame for war crimes on ethnic minorities and deflect that away from ethnic Russians, which, in, in reality, Russians must be equally culpable for many of the crimes that are being committed. Uh, absolutely. And I think, you know, um, the war crimes committed in Bucha, that was one example, because there has been this, you know, very amplified narratives that there were Buryats in Bucha, and everyone picked it up. You know, it was New York Times, I believe, who also used that, etc. Uh, and then again, thanks to Maria, you know, and her <laughs> efforts, uh, she actually, her research proves um, that no, uh, it were actually... Um, I believe it was a military group from Pskov who uh, was uh, most complacent uh, in that. That is, you know, again, not to say that uh, ethnic representatives of ethnic minorities and indigenous people do not commit crime. They're part of the Russian army. You know, they, they do it. Um, I don't think we, we can place disproportional blame, though, you know. And again, that this is a very... That's playing I, um, on you know, global racist tendencies, because uh, 
I think uh, Russian propaganda, of course, started it. And then very quickly, there was this narrative picked up. Oh, they're Asian. You know, that's the some Mongolian historical tradition of being brutal, et cetera, and et cetera. Uh, well, and, and that's pure racism to me, um, you know. Um, yeah. And yeah, well, I mean, it seems that that brutality is a conscious military strategy, you know, whatever its historic roots are, um, it's 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 not something that's in people's DNA. It seems to be a conscious uh, strategy adopted by military commanders. So again, it would perhaps be deflecting to try and blame some sort of historic roots on that, especially if those roots are Asiatic, um, and try to resolve, you know, absolve um, white European so-called Russians uh, from these behaviours, because these behaviours seem to be uh, fairly en endemic within the Russian army. And of course, a strategy adopted by uh, not just a few officers, but systematically by the army as a whole. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I agree with you. Uh, and um, yeah, I just think it's it's important also to note that, um, you know, when I was uh, interviewing Maria Vyushkova recently and we were talking about this, uh, you know, disproportionate casualty numbers, she said a very interesting thing to me. She said, you know, we're counting this, but ethnic identity is such an ambiguous thing, you know, but we can't ask the person, you know, if, if you know, that they might have... Uh, you know, they might have spoke Buryat or from Buryat village, you know, etc. But did they really identify as such, you know, um, and we can't ask them there anymore, they're dead. Um, so, you know, it's also a very, mm, I mean, that's more of a philosophical question, you know, what ethnic identity is, and do those people really consider themselves, you know, colonized, oppressed, um, or was you know being part of that russian world you know the greater russia a very conscious choice and often we see a, a sort of post-soviet inheritance isn't it that those people who consciously decide to become part of the administrative class um or even the sylvia key class um will become to a greater extent russian russified um and they may keep their native identities really as a minority or something they explore at home but certainly it's not a public persona. It's quite a complex thing, isn't it? How far did that sort of Soviet nomenclature kind of thing that would comprise of ethnic Russians and local minorities who are Russified, how far did that continue through the 90s into the present? So I think, you know, in, in ethnic republics, it's a very interesting thing. I agree with you. Uh, a lot of the people we see, particularly, you know, in the Kremlin and the Russian leadership, well, Hello, you know, Sergei Sho Shoigu, he's ethnic Tuvan, he's from Tuva. Uh, Tuva right now also has some of the largest casualty numbers per uh, 10,000 working men. You know, also very brutal mobilization. Uh, clearly, you know, his rank and influence didn't stop him from mobilizing his own people and literally sending them to, you know, meat grinder. Um, in uh, the republics, I think, uh, you know, it varies very much. Again, you know, with Tatarstan, um, it's very interesting because uh, if you listen to Rustam Minhanov, our, uh, still call him president, uh, you know, he speaks Russian with an accent. Uh, he prefers using Tatar everywhere. And uh, Minhanov, uh, he's kind of, you know, uh, more of a like village boy, uh, you know, who uh, f did really preserve his identity. You know, he, he is Tatar. Um, He's still, you know, complacent with Russia's military crimes. You know, Tatarstan is doing horrific things. Uh, it um, supplies drones, etc. Uh, yet, you know, he he, he does have the identity. Uh, in um, many other re re uh, ethnic republics, Kremlin in recent years has really, uh, you know, cleaned out the field. So uh, most of the first, you know, presidents. Uh, who came to power during that parade of sovereignty era in the 90s in ethnic republics, uh, they were really, you know, true locals. Um, you know, uh, they were all for preserving local languages. A lot of them chose to spoke um, indigenous languages in public, et cetera, et cetera. But then gradually 
Kremlin started replacing them, um, you know, well, Putin particularly, you know, granted himself those powers that he can appoint the heads. Uh, so uh, again, you know, Bashkortostan is a very interesting example of first president, um, Murtaza Rahimov. He was an ethnic Bashkort from an ethnic Bashkort district. Um, it was really pushing uh, to have most of his, you know, local nomenclatura uh, were ethnic Bashkorts. Bashkir language was uh, thriving really during his presidency. Um, and then he fell out of favor with Kremlin and the Kremlin reappointed uh, a new governor, you know, who uh, was in fact an ethnic Tatar. Uh, I'm not even sure if he spoke Bashkort that well. Uh, but was very, very close to the Kremlin. You know, he used to work in Moscow. Uh, current governor of Bashkortostan, um, same thing, he speaks Bashkort, he's from Bashkortostan, but he worked um, as the head of Krasnogorsk district in Moscow region for many, many, many years. So he is, uh, you know, one and the same with the Kremlin. Uh, and uh, I mean, clearly, you know, Putin really loves him. He wouldn't even replace him after this whole mismanagement absolute of protests. Um, so yeah, uh, you know, the, in, in, uh, Russian political science, they call it the Varyaks, you know, the, um, who they, who Kremlin brings, uh, to, uh, ethnic republics. It's the same thing in the Caucasus, uh, you know, um, I think the most interesting case was Yevkurov, who is now, um, uh, part of, uh, Russian ministry, uh, of defense, and he was the head, uh, of Ingushetia during the 2018-2019 protests uh, against new borders with uh, Chechnya. Uh, and he really brutally suppressed those protests. And, you know, um, he was Kremlin's man, even though he was uh, an Ingush, you know, etc. cetera. Uh, and uh, Kremlin then rewarded him with a promotion, you know, back to the Ministry um, of Defense. So it is, you know, Kremlin has really cleaned up that system. Uh, mm -hmm. And there is a very blurred lines between loyalty to the Kremlin and ethnic identity. And some Ukrainians could argue that Yanukovych very much fits in that mold, a Kremlin man um, who is ethnic. Uh, well, uh, I'm just not sure of his ethnicity, as it were. I mean, he's Ukrainian, but I'm, I'm not sure whether his ancestry is fully Russian or partly. But essentially, it's a similar kind of thing. You, you make sure there is someone who is, uh, at least on some level, has loyalty to the Kremlin and its messages. Ukraine has managed to, however, go on a process of de-Russification, um, not just uh, culturally, because that's that's the last one to happen, and it's the one that was very much really happening in reaction to Russia's aggression, rather than a proactive process prior to aggression, prior to 2014, um, you'd have found far in a less or, or no real animosity towards Russian language literature at that point, but it's accelerated, obviously, with, with the aggression that's happened. Um, and there are various processes uh, happening. One is cleaning out the um, oligarch class, which, again, tend to have a, a certain level of, uh, uh, I would say, sort of uh, ambiguity uh, in, in where their loyalties lie. Um and uh, mafia classes, corruption. There's all sorts of mechanisms by which Moscow exerts control um, and can dial up or dial down the amount of control it has over a public. What do uh, Russia's indigenous people need to develop um, in terms of their own political culture, identity, language, etc., but also institutions in order to really accelerate this process of reducing Moscow's influence? Or is that is that really a pointless question at this time when we're we're entering a a period of, of intense repression? Yeah, I think you know I I don't think we will see any in any changes you know in the coming year because it is brutal. Uh, you know, in fact, uh, Bashkortostan right now is one of the greatest victims because the number of people arrested in relation to recent uh, and I would underline peaceful protests uh, is about to reach, you know, a hundred. And these are people facing criminal um, persecution. Um, so, you know, of, co of course that people are scared, people, people are uh, silenced. And I think uh, a very interesting dynamic in Bashkortostan, uh, and it is important um, to understand, you know, how, how we can change that 
is that uh, a lot of the blame for these repressions was put on uh, Radzi Khabirov, the local head, and Putin avoided most of it. In fact, a lot of relatives uh, of um, people who are now um, imprisoned, um, they have recorded this video appeals to Vladimir Putin uh, asking, you know, to take note of the situation and free their innocent relatives. Uh, but that's a very clever strategy, uh, you know, on behalf of the Kremlin that it used in 2020 when there were protests um, uh, against mining at the, against limestone, sto limestone mining at Kustau. And then Putin seemingly, you know, interfered and ordered, you know, uh, the local government to meet the demands of the protests. So it created this false impression that Kremlin is on the people's side, you know. Um, and I think uh, I will cite here, you know, uh, the founder of Free Kutia found the co-founder of Free Kutia Foundation, Sergalana Kondakova, who in one of the interviews with me, you know, she said decolonization must begin with the mines. And until we do that job, uh, you know, nothing. We can't talk about institutions. We can't talk about anything. Uh, and I think Bashkoristan is a good example. You know, even um, kind of showing people, no, 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 there is this link, you know, between what is happening to your relatives and what and the policies that the man in the Kremlin uh, is implementing. Uh, you know, um, there might have been a more clear link with the, um, language destruction because it was Putin himself who ordered in 2018, uh, you know, the language reform that essentially stopped indigenous languages from being taught, you know, and used in um, schools across Russia. So people understood that. But now I think, you know, with the war um, and with these repressions, uh, and, I mean, Kremlin has been doing that for ages. It really succeeded in putting the blame on regional government. So, you know, that creates this false, I guess, impression of federalism for people. They think, you know, that local governments still possess so much power that, you know, it's it's the two-way street and Kremlin has nothing to do with it. Um, yeah, so, you know, I, I think breaking down this system will really begin with the minds. And uh, there is a lot, you know, there is a, there are generational traumas that we have to deal with, uh, you know, for most of us, uh, well, I am a product, you know, of Russification. My parents consciously chose not to teach me Tatar language because, you know, speaking Russian with an accent is like, you know, a death sentence to your career. Um, and uh, until, you know, we unlearn that, no, 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 it's good, you know, to speak your native language. It's okay to speak Russian with an accent. It's not the only language in the world by far. Um, you know, until we uh, learn that, you know, we should be proud of our identity, uh, etc. Uh, I don't think we can even start talking, you know, of uh, institutional developments. Um, and I mean, in many places, you know, in the republics, there is at least some basis, you know, institutional basis that was created in the 1990s. I mean, Kremlin dismantled most of it for better or worse, but um, there is at least a baseline from which we can start. Um, but I think that the hardest thing uh, to deal with is the decolonization of mind. Um, and that's, uh, you know, it, it might take years. Uh, thank God, you know, there's so many indigenous movements now that are not scared, you know, they, they repeat some of the things that, you know, might seem obvious to us over and over again, uh, just to, you know, let people hear that. Um, in fact, you know, uh, I think that's what, uh, you know, we didn't go through this uh, kind of reckoning, right, with the traumas of Soviet repressions, we didn't speak uh, of how, you know, Tsarist Russia and then the Soviet Union was suppressing ethnic minorities. That never happened. And I think that's why we're here right now. Um, and uh, since, you know, we have mostly Western audience in this podcast, I do want to underline that um, I don't want to say that there is the West is to blame. Uh, but I think this inability to see past Moscow and willingness to work with Moscow elites uh, and kind of you know, lack of imaginative thinking when approaching Russia uh, has also led to that. And uh, I'm a huge advocate. I think uh, the West could have built, you know, better links with um, 
regional governments, you know, particularly with Tatarstan. Uh, Tatarstan still has uh, economic representation that is independent of Moscow in many, many countries. Uh, you know, Tatarstan was really out there trying to do bilateral dip diplomacy. Uh, there are very few countries that seize that opportunity, Turkey being one of them. Uh, you know, very interesting relationship between Tatarstan and Turkey that goes um, completely, you know, um, that sidelines Moscow completely. Uh, and we've seen that, uh, you know, many, many times through the past 20 years, whenever relations between Ankara and Moscow would deteriorate, Kazani would say, no, sorry, we, we were not part of that. We'll continue our dealings. Um, so, you know, and I think um, if the West um, seizes this opportunity now and sees kind of more avenues to work with the regions, that's also part of decolonization, you know, on, on, on both sides. Um, also because that will send people the signal, you know, that they have greater agency. Um, and that's also important. And that really was going to be my last question, because um, we remember just before Ukrainian independence, there is evidence that, that Bush and the American administration were extremely paranoid about uh, the USSR breaking up. After decades of essentially struggling against the USSR, they feared that process of collapse. They even advocated strongly for Ukraine to remain part of a federalized Russia. Um, and as soon as Ukraine actually clearly voted for um, independence, which is something that almost no analysts predicted, um, extraordinary certain, because again, they're looking at things through a, through a Moscow lens. At that point, the West very much shifted into the gear to completely take away Ukraine's or negotiate away Ukraine's ability to defend itself, you know, destroy its bomber fleet, air bomber fleet, destroy uh, uh, its uh, nuclear arsenal, completely defang its military and turn it into essentially a neutral buffer zone, which is exactly what Moscow wanted. You know, this thing they've demanding uh, and supposedly the cause of the current war. Well, we, we did that in the 90s. Um, is there a is there a worry here that that same mindset of being terrified of so-called Russian collapse means that the West will not, not only not think creatively about engaging, it will try its hardest to prevent Russia from collapsing and decolonizing. Yeah, I mean, um, it's very interesting, you know, because Tatarstan voted for independence <laughs> in the 1990s. There's evidence of, yet, of that. And the few international observers who were present were representatives of the United States and of the Helsinki Commission. And uh, there is, in fact, a report that they wrote on that, elec uh, on that election and that uh, vote for sovereignty that is still available online has very interesting phrasing because it is, you know, just all through that report, you can feel this, you know, fear that some alien Muslim strange people are trying to get out of Russia. God prevent them from doing that. Uh, you know, so I mean, a similar thing, you know, um, Thank God, you know, Ukraine, Ukraine was able to uh, get the independence, you know, with Tatarstan, of course, it's harder. It's we, we're also uh, surrounded by Russia all around. Um, you know, I think uh, it's important for me, and I always underline that um, when, you know, people speak of decolonization of Russia, they imagine this, you know, messy collapse of this landmass. Um, but I think it's important to go back to the basics and say that, no, we want to give those people, um, you know, the basic right that they're entitled to, to decide their future. And we've just seen one very, like, sham election in Russia again. Uh, yet, you know, I know for a fact, people in Bashkoristan, they go to the polls, a lot of them voted not for Putin, of course, uh, you know. And I think that's that's where it should start. Uh, we should give people the right, you know, to decide what they want to do with their future. Um, you know, I know for certain that for many people living in ethnic republics, it's also horrifying the possibility of, you know, collapse. Uh, a lot, you know, advocate for greater federalization. Uh, in fact, you know, um, 
and I think Brexit is a great example, you know, economic interdependence is important. Uh, and we can't just, you know, shut down any one republic from its neighbors. So I think, you know, a greater kind of confederate arrangement, a sort of a European Union, you know, with more equal rights among the regions is the best solution for what is happening. Um, and uh, maybe we should stop using the scary word decolonization and that will, you know, um, appeal to Western politicians more. Uh, yeah, but I think, you know, uh, and that has been my message over and over again. I just want to give, you know, my people the basic democratic right that they're entitled to. And from there on, uh, they can decide to themselves, you know, if they want to stay with Russia or not. Uh, you know, I am quite certain that the people of Chechnya, you know, who have witnessed so much brutality uh, from Russia, I don't think they would want to remain, you know, a part of that landmass. Uh, and it might be quite different, uh, you know, for even Bashkoristan, you know, or other Volga republics. Um, yeah, but that all should be decided by the people who live there. Radical federalization, greater freedom, a certain level of autonomy, respect for indigenous languages, cultures, that might be enough to prevent it. After all, you know, I mean, despite um, extraordinary, uh, I say, ill treatment on some level by Scotland, by the Westminster Parliament, nonetheless, people there, uh, the majority voted to stay within the union. That was prior to Brexit. I don't know what the result would be now, but it, it's possible that in a, in, a, in, a, in a more liberal Russia, as you say, it wouldn't necessarily need to collapse if those freedoms were granted uh, and uh, republics were allowed to develop and keep, I guess the key also is to keep more of the wealth and resources that are part of their uh, local territory, control more of that direct taxation without it going to Moscow. Complex problems though. Um, I'd love to revisit this because who knows? I mean, the coming months, I think they're going to uh, show that, that Russia is increasingly brittle um, and it's unpredictable what's going to happen. But I'd love to speak again about these issues and track how they play out uh, through the year and as uh, as the war, unfortunately, grinds on. Yes, absolutely. Well, um, I do want to say that right now our best bet is supporting Ukraine. So, you know... Uh, whoever listens, U Ukrainian victory will decide all. Uh, so I think that's that's what we are all praying, hoping for, and hoping for more weapons. Well, Leila, thank you so much. That's a very powerful message to end our conversation on. Thank you so much for sharing your expertise and experience with the audience and spending so much time to go through these complex issues with us. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me.